seek them out. As shepherds seek out their flocks when they are among their scattered sheep, so I will seek out my sheep. I will rescue them from all the places to which they have been scattered on a day of clouds and thick darkness. I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries and will bring them into their own land and I will feed them on the mountains of Israel by the water courses, and in all the inhabited parts of the land. I will feed them with good pasture, and the mountain heights of Israel shall be their pasture. They shall lie down in good grazing land, and they shall feed on rich pasture on the mountains of Israel. I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep. I will make them lie down, says the Lord God. I will seek the lost, and I will bring back the stray, and I will bind up the injured, and I will strengthen the weak. But the fat and the strong I will destroy. I will feed them with justice. Therefore, thus says the Lord God to them, I myself will judge between the fat sheep and the lean sheep. Because you pushed with flank and shoulder, 
and butted at all the weak animals with your horns until you scatter them far and wide, I will save my flock, and they shall no longer be ravaged. And I will judge between sheep and sheep. I will set up over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he shall feed them. He shall feed them and be their shepherd. And I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David shall be prince among them. I, the Lord, have spoken. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Psalm 100, read responsibly by the half verse. Be joyful in the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness, and come before his presence with a song. Know this, the Lord himself is God. He himself has made us, and we are his. We are his people, and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving, go into his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and all of what is in for the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting. A reading from the letter of Paul to the Ephesians. I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints. And for this reason, I do not cease to give thanks for you as I remember you in my prayers. I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation as you come to know him, so that, with the eyes of your heart enlightened, you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance among the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power for us who believe, according to the working of his great power. God put this power to work in Christ when he raised him from the dead, and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority, and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. And he has put all things under his feet, and has made him the head over all things for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him, who fills all in all. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus said, When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate people one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep in his right hand, and the goats at his left hand. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, you that are blessed by my Father, and inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food, or thirsty, and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you, or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, Truly, I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. Then he will say to those at his left hand, You that are accursed, depart from me into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not give me clothing. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? Then he will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise you, Lord Christ. <clears throat> In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. It was the last parable Jesus would give before his crucifixion. This entire conversation we've been following now for weeks through the Gospel of Matthew was essentially in response to the two questions that the disciples asked Jesus after he foretold the destruction of the temple in Matthew 24. Their first question was, understandably, when will this be? And the second one was, what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And so from that question until today's reading, Jesus is responding to those questions. All of these conversations Jesus has on the Mount of Olives are designed to show us in different ways what it does and what it does not look like to live in God's reality. A reality that the Bible calls the kingdom of heaven. To begin with, I think that it's important to understand what Jesus means by this phrase, the kingdom of heaven. We see it so much and we talk about it so often that it's easy to gloss over it and assume that Jesus is talking about some far off reality that occurs after he comes back in the future. If we look at how Jesus uses this phrase, the kingdom of heaven, or the kingdom of God, or the kingdom of the Son of Man, there's a whole lot of evidence to point to the idea that he is not talking about some future reality, but a present reality, a current state of affairs that is directly related to, to life, right then and there. Because Jesus is there, the kingdom of heaven has come to earth. 
And the Gospels, we see Jesus repeatedly talking about how the kingdom of heaven is at hand and the kingdom of he- heaven has come near. In other words, it's, it's now. It's not something that will be, but now. It's important to understand because in today's parable, Jesus talks about the separation of the sheep and the goats based on how they treated others who were in need. We read that the sheep, of course, inherited the kingdom prepared for them for the, before the foundation of the world. So they showed themselves a part of the present reality of the kingdom of heaven by taking care of the least of those around them and ultimately taking care of Jesus, right? But the goats, who did not care for the needy among them, and in turn did not care for Jesus, departed from the kingdom of heaven and instead went into eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Now, I want to put on the brakes here for a second. This parable, even though it sounds incredibly apocalyptic to our modern ears, is not, in my opinion, a parable about the goats going to hell for all eternity. In order to understand that conclusion that I'm making, it's it's necessary to put together two ideas. You've got the idea of the kingdom of heaven being a present reality because Jesus is there among them. And you've got the idea that it is possible for people to choose to live in a way that is contrary to the teachings of Jesus and contrary to the kingdom of heaven. Just like the kingdom of heaven prepared for us before the foundations of the world is present and available to us now through Jesus, the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels is available as a present reality that people can choose to live in now. I mean, we see people who choose to live that way every day around us. And Jesus is outlining here two different kingdoms with two very different citizens and outcomes. One of the problems that comes with assuming that Jesus is talking about this far off punishment coming for the goats among us or a reward coming for the good sheep when we die is that it removes the present expectation for the way and the teachings of Jesus to make an impact in our lives now. If our only focus is on some distant future event, then it's really, really easy to just keep on going day in and day out, living however we want. I mean, we'll get to acting like sheep eventually, of course, but right now we're just going to act like Democrats or Republicans or Auburn fans or Alabama fans. (laughs) You might know from listening to me talk week after week that I think translations are a pretty big deal when we study the text of the Bible. If we aren't careful, we'll end up getting attached to various translations that can sometimes prevent us from opening our hearts up to the ocean of meaning and wisdom that can come from Scripture It's pretty difficult at times to pinpoint an exact and absolutely correct translation of a word because of how descriptive and nuanced and beautiful the Greek language is. The Greek word for this lightning term punishment that comes at the end of our reading today is kolossus. And as it turns out, Some scholars argue that punishment is not the best translation. Colossus carries with it an idea of pruning, of being cut back with an expectation of restoring to help what is being pruned. This word is only used one other time in the New Testament in 1 John 
where we read about how punishment is related to fear and how the perfect love of God casts out all fear. It's used quite a number of times, as you might imagine, in the Hebrew Scriptures, the Old Testament, usually in reference to what happens to the children of Israel when they disobey God. Over and over and over again, they mess up and God gives them over to destruction and punishment only to raise them up again and to restore them to another chance at participation in the kingdom of heaven. Rather than talking about a future punishment in the fires of hell, I think Jesus is talking about the destruction that happens in our societies and in our hearts when we choose not to take care of the poor and the needy in our midst. This pruning punishment happens in order to ultimately restore the kingdom of heaven and to ensure the care of everyone because we are all of us co-heirs of Jesus and beloved children of God. When the disciples ask the question to kick this whole discourse off, when will this destruction take place? What will be the signs of the end of the age and your coming? They didn't understand at that moment that Jesus was going to die, even though he told them it was going to happen. They were so intently focused on this idea of overcoming and overthrowing the Roman occupation. So there wasn't this understanding of a second coming of Jesus in the distant future. They were asking about how and when Jesus was going to take over and establish his kingdom here on earth by power and by force and by strength. What would be the signs of the end of the age, the age of Roman oppression? Jesus would not only answer their question, but through his teachings on the Mount of Olives, he would challenge the basic way that they thought about strength and about power and about need and about the kingdom of heaven. He would challenge their understanding of what he actually came for. And that's what he's been doing through the parable of the wise and foolish bridesmaids, the parable of the talents, now the parable of the sheep and the goats, all describing these two options for living, joining Jesus and spreading and revealing and living in the reality of God, the kingdom of heaven here on earth, or living according to the kingdom of the world, with all of its deceit and mistreatment and pain and unredeemed suffering, where people are taken advantage of, where the rich get richer and the poor get poorer, and the power goes to those who take it and misuse it for their own selfish gain. The kingdom of heaven the reality of God is that Jesus, the best picture we have of the nature of God in history, chooses to locate himself with and identify with those who are the least in our society. To such a degree that he says, whatever you have done to serve the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you have literally done to me. Matthew consistently brings back to my mind what scripture says about Jesus. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking on the form of a slave and being Born in human likeness and found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. We should make no mistake this morning on the feast of Christ the King 
that Jesus, the suffering servant, does not side with power. In a world and in a moment where it seems like everyone is clamoring for power and everything depends on it, Jesus calls us to be citizens of a country not of this world. He calls us to see his face and to meet him in the poor, the needy, the destitute, the cast off, the outsider, the oppressed, the underdog, those who are different from us. And not only to see his face in these folks, but to do something about it. To serve Jesus in everyone we know. So this morning, there is only a simple question for us. Which kingdom are we going to live in? Are we going to lie down with the sheep or with the goats? Amen. stand and affirm the words of our ancient faith, found in the ninth and creed in your worship of these Sing together. We believe in one God, the Father the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light. True God from true God, begotten, not made, by one being of the Father, who through him all things were made, for us and for our salvation, beginning at our own hand, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary, and was made a man. For our sake he was crucified in the conscious life, he suffered death from the Spirit. On the third day he rose again, and the Lord was Christ's body, O gracious one, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Inspire our service to the least of these, that we may feed the hungry, give drink to the thirsty, welcome strangers, clothe the naked and visit the imprisoned as faithful servants of the hope to which Christ has called us. For you are our God. We are the people of your pastor, and the sheep of your land. Gather the nations before you, O sovereign one, to feed your creation with justice, <coughs> for you are our God. We are the people of your pasture, and the of your name. Look upon all the people of the earth, O compassionate one, to seek the scattered and feed them with good pasture. Light them down 
Let them lie down in good grazing land, where the, their God may be their shepherd. For you are our God. We are the people of your master, and the of your hand. Enlighten the eyes of the hearts of the people of this community, that we may live in the hope to which Jesus has called us, and put power to work in Christ. For you are our God. We are the people of your master, and the of your hand. Seek the lost, O loving one, bring back the strayed, bind up the injured, and strengthen the weak, especially those for whom we offer intercession. We pray especially for the family of Blaise Ledet, Ashley, the family of Brenda Myers, Brenda, Judith, George, Bill, JoLynn, Franklin, George, Chloe, Molly, Casey, Cody, Sophia, Tanya, Carol, Brian, Rhea and Larry, Tim and Robbie, Dan, Leslie, Kathy and Tony, and all those in need of prayer. Are there others? We also pray for those on our long-term prayer list. Russell, Rosellen, Denson, Cynthia, Stephen, Judd, Margaret, John, Donna, Kristen, Chuck, Martha, Adrian, Will, Kermit, Ivan, Dean, Janet, Jean, Tom, Pat, and Francis. We pray for all first responders and all in the armed forces and for their families. Joe, Tim, Christopher, Lewis, Patrick, Brandon, <coughs> Ashlyn, Sarah Grace, Bernie, John, Hunter, Joey, Austin, Julian, Eric, Zane, and all in harm's way. Are there others? In the diocesan cycle of prayer, we pray for our fellow parish of the Christ the King in Santa Rosa Beach, Florida. We pray for the victims of crime everywhere, for the inmates and staff of the Wilcox County Detention Center in Camden, Alabama, and for their families. In the Anglican cycle of prayer, we pray for the Diocese of Idaho. We pray for all people affected by natural disasters and war. Accept our thanksgiving for all the goodness of life especially the wedding anniversary of Jerry and Frank. Bring those who have died to the riches of Christ's glorious inheritance among the saints, especially Rosalind Carter, Blaise Ledette, Ledet, and Donna Eslina. May all humanity inherit the kingdom prepared for us from before the foundation of the world. For you are our God. We, we are the people of your God. We are you are our God, the righteous shepherd, and you care for all your sheep. Lead your creation to fullness of your compassion, that with the eyes of our hearts enlightened, all people may know the kindness of your care and the riches of your glory. In Jesus Christ, our Savior, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Every once in a while, I'm moved to make a comment about one of the aspects of our common liturgy work together. And this morning, I thought it would be appropriate to just make a mention real quickly as we go through our confession and our absolution. Uh, sometimes it's easy to think that what is happening here is that we are trying to keep our sin account list short so that God approves of us. I don't think that's what's going on, just so we're clear. Um, what happens in our absolution and confession is that we are bringing ourselves transparently before the everlasting love and forgiveness of God. And so uh, when we make that confession together, we are agreeing that this is the nature of our broken humanity and our, our nature. And at the same time, when I pronounce an absolution over you, there's no power within me to forgive you of your sins. I have been charged with the responsibility of proclaiming the reality of the kingdom of heaven over you and about you. And so, sometimes it's helpful just to think of things in that way. Consider it just a moment of, of teaching. Maybe I just needed to be reminded of that. But as we enter into our confession and absolution, I invite you to remain seated, to stand or to kneel as it you pray. confess our sins against God and our neighbor, saying together, God, God, Lord, 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 Lord,
We confess that we have sinned against you, opposing your will on our lives. We have denied your goodness in each other, and ourselves in the world we have created. We repent of the evil that has slaked us, the evil we have done, and the evil done on our behalf. Forgive, restore, and strengthen us through our Savior Jesus Christ, that we may abide in your love and serve only in your will. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. And now as we stand together, my brothers and sisters, may the peace of the Lord be always with you. Sunday, and so on fourth Sundays, uh, we've taken to providing some sandwiches and some fruit and beer salt after our 10.30 Eucharist, and so you're invited to join us for that uh, as soon as the, uh, the service is over. We will be uh, having coffee and conversation uh, after about 15 or 20 minutes of that kind of thing. Uh, here in the parish hall, it's just an opportunity for an informal conversation. Maybe something jumped out at you through one of the readings or part of the liturgy or in the sermon that you've got a question about or you just want to make a comment about, you are more than welcome and invited to sit with us around one of these tables in here and, uh, and talk about it because we are built up better when we share as the body of Christ um, the things that the Spirit is saying to God's people in our hearts. Uh, so please join us for that. Um, we've got Advent season here quickly upon us, and it's going to seem like a very short Advent, because Advent 4 and Christmas Eve are the same day. <laughs> and so it's going to feel like we're missing an entire week, but we're just cramming that week into one day. Uh, so don't worry, we'll get, we'll get all the Advents in there. Uh, Christmas Eve and Advent 4 are the same day. We'll do Advent 4 in the morning, Christmas Eve at night. Um, through the season of Advent, though, I'm hosting at noon a study uh, through various themes of Advent that we're going to do here in the parish hall. That's Tuesday at noon, uh, so please do come and be a part of that. We'll be distributing those studies the week before um, so that you can read and be prepared on Tuesday to be a part of that. Um, they'll be here at the church available for you, and there'll be a link to that in the Christian app as well. Um, our stewardship pain, campaign, I almost said our stewardship pain. <laughs> I think it was right the first time. <laughs> it's still ongoing. Uh, we're going to be concluding that uh, with a potluck on December 10th, a celebration. Uh, so consider this a little nudge, one, one of the few more nudges you will get before we're done with the stewardship campaign. Um, Thank you for prayerfully considering how you can be a part of the body of Christ that is known as St. Paul's Chapel here in this community through your gifts of your time and your talent and your treasures. Um, lots of other things, angel tree um, offerings and opportunities to care for our angels on our angel tree are in the parish hall on the mantelpiece there. If you'd like to um, be a part of that ministry, uh, where we're providing gifts for the angels on our cards there. We encourage you to do that. Those gifts need to be returned to the church by December 10th so that we can get those delivered um, to where they're going. And then uh, there's lots more that you can read all throughout the rest of this, um, this, this leaflet. Add lessons and carols are coming up December 3rd at 4 p.m. sandwiched in between 
cookies with Santa and the lighting uh, of the tree. And so we're going to be a part of that in our community. Please come and be a part of that uh, and celebrate with us as we do every year. Uh, walk in love, my brothers and sisters. And offer yourself to God as Christ offered himself <coughs> sacrifice. Shame, 
our undying dreams, and our steadfast resolve. At this table of grace and goodness, we meet you for the sacred communion with all of creation. And so this day, we join the saints and angels in the chorus of praise that reigns through eternity, lifting our voices to magnify you as we sing.
the name of Christ. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.